So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, with you about um, narrative. Uh, and, and the importance of uh, narrative uh, in our work. We are uh, in uh, uh, the West, uh, we are in the midst of doing uh, ministry, what we in the Diocese of Texas say mission, uh, a mission of service uh, and evangelism, uh, but we recognize that we do that in a particular context, um, that we are working on God's behalf, uh, but we are always in the midst of a frame, a, a way in which the world uh, operates normally, if you will. Uh, and the way in which our world operates uh, is uh, through, uh, is oriented towards and for uh, the individual uh, alone. Uh, and part of that is uh, what um, uh, uh, Michael R. Beeb and Mary Hess uh, uh, once called during the Gifford Lectures on Natural Theology, once called a, a two-way spatio-temporal truth, which sounds really good. You could entertain people at parties by throwing that around, two-way spatio-temporal truth. Uh, Basically, it means what you, what you see and what you decide is true is true. <laughs> That's the simplest way of saying it. If you think it's true, it's true because you've seen it and you have this idea that you are this buffered self influenced by nobody. Nobody gave you a hand up. Nobody taught you. You are able to, it's as if like you're Augustine of Hippo in the confessions, you sprung from your mother's womb perfectly formed and able to take in the universe and make decisions. And I love, I love the confessions, but that is the, that is the idea here. Uh, we in this uh, uh, country, I fear, do not have a big enough theology in which to engage such a narrative. Uh, and uh, I worry and, and a lot of us are talking about this, not just bishops, but clergy. I'm worried that we have not formed our people in such a way as to prepare them to uh, reject, if you will, uh, such an individualistic way of uh, seeing the world. And so if we were to look at scripture, we might think, and I like to think, about Paul in Athens uh, in the marketplace, right? Uh, we actually find ourselves uh, in the midst of uh, what uh, uh, Neil Gaiman said, American gods. We, we find ourselves in the midst of an American pantheon of gods, whether it be partisan politics, economic uh, things, wealth, uh, any kind of uh, a god you could imagine, technology. Now we are in the midst of that, and in some way, we have not done the work that Paul does uh, in, uh, in Athens, which is to convince first uh, uh, people in a, uh, in, in that there is only one God, uh, and secondly, that Jesus Christ is the revelation of that God. Uh, and we have not undermined, if you will, uh, this uh, individualism, which is, is so uh, rampant. So, I, I find that I am constantly working to shift and reorient myself uh, and reminding myself that God is not participating in my narrative. Uh, uh, God is, uh, I'm not doing the work of uh, showing people where God is in their story. Uh, the work of the church is to help uh, people find their lives in the midst of God's story in the midst of what God is doing, uh, the God that is the God in which we move and live and have our being, as Paul uh, says, uh, adapting that poem about Zeus, that, 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 uh, that God uh, uh, invites us into God's story by our very creation, and that God is at work in this world. God is doing uh, good things in the midst of uh, this VUCA world that we live in. Uh, and, uh, and in this way, we are uh, 
uh, and I like the image of the discipline, the faithful discipline of following this God into leadership and into mission. Um, this is this is uh, this is our work to engage, as I like to call it, God's garden social imaginary, how God imagines the world. We're to lean towards and into an apocalyptic vision that draws us forward to the kingdom uh, of God. But that is God at work in the world. And I find that what we, we need to reclaim is an understanding, if you will, of a constitutive or a, uh, 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 an understanding that what we are doing in our work is meaning making, uh, that we are applying, uh, adapting, adopting, uh, finding the language and words for God's narrative uh, in the context and world that we have. Uh, Rowan Williams calls this a variegated pattern of activity, not limited, uh, or even Hess would say, to uh, grammar. <laughs> uh, this is this is big. This is a, a variegated pattern that moves into the world. And so we understand that the gospel and the very story that God is crafting is one of embodiment. Uh, I liked how Rob uh, talked about the downward work uh, of, of Christianity. Uh, God's narrative is embodied. It's always uh, been embodied. Uh, and that God is at work and an active force uh, uh, bringing to our attention those quotes from Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Love is overthrowing everything that's not love. Justice is love rebelling against everything that is not love. God is at work moving us uh, 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 towards God's kingdom, uh, offering us opportunity to move to the edge of words, to embody the gospel, uh, and the work of service and evangelism. And, and that what we really are doing is uh, uh, not uh, sticking to um, uh, a kind of prescribed uh, liturgical use of, uh, of grammar, but rather we are uh, expanding the power and the use of God's language in the world uh, around us. That we're we are bringing about, whether we are preaching, teaching, working, serving, listening, we are bringing about God's narrative construction in the world. We're, uh, we are struggling uh, to say something uh, at the edge of words and as language animals, as Christians uh, who uh, see as the primary revelation this living word of, of Jesus Christ, uh, and that, um, and that, and that, and the truth is that we might, we might be like Moses who stutters, or we might need the uh, hot coals put on our tongues like prophets, or we might be feeling mute like Simeon because we don't grasp this just exactly the way that God is pushing us to see, but God invites us to embody, uh, and, and move towards uh, the world around us. And this is, this is the deep meaning of vocation. Vocation has completely been adopted for a lot of reasons we could go into by prof uh, and equated with professionalism, but vocation, its actual word vocatio means to go on behalf of, to speak on behalf of, to use the words, to literally speak out the living words of God's narrative into of the world. That is uh, uh, the vocation, uh, the, the act there, and that, uh, and that we want to recognize that that language is far beyond just listening and hearing, and it is an embodied, uh, uh, one of the reasons why we're so tired as we do this work on Zoom is that actually the embodiment of language is made up. Uh, uh, we are constantly, though our minds filter it, we are constantly, constantly sensing uh, the slightest uh, moves of a face, uh, a hand, uh, a posture, a smile, the eyes that our body, uh, we are taking in 
bodily embodied signals of language as people engage, we are actually missing something in this uh, work that we are doing. It, it isn't the same. It is very, very different. And so what's happening is a few of our sensors are having to work overtime to do, uh, to do, this, to do this work. Uh, and so what we want to recognize is that uh, there's a lot that comes in. We could call them landscapes and schemes or schemas. There are many terms for this, but uh, the world in which we live is porous with meaning of God's narrative. It is all around. God is speaking all the time in the midst of this. We don't have to go out and do it for God. God's there. We have to go out and join God in the midst of doing the work that God is doing. And we may give voice or we may embody this ap apocalyptic vision of God's in gathering out in the world, but, but God is certainly uh, there. And, and what I want to be clear is I am I'm rejecting uh, this uh, uh, idea that uh, we uh, exist in this, in this small area uh, of deeply rooted on a canon of language, kind of confined to our private spaces, uh, and that, uh, that the gospel and God's narrative isn't actually a part of the whole creation around us. Uh, and that uh, as we bend and lean into God's narrative, and I, and I like the idea uh, Rob had of the discipline of, of prayer, right, and leaning into what God is doing, and, and, this, and the seven different ways we do that in our prayer book, right, this, this sense that as we do that, we actually are inheriting and uh, uh, reopening the language of our faith ancestors in this context and time. We are uh, receiving a very real revelation for our moment. And, and when we do that in our context, community, and relationships, it has motivational power. It has motivational power to change the world uh, around us. Um, uh, we must recognize that we are creating the systems, the structures, the church that we have. <laughs> uh, if, we, if we're living in this church, it's because we have manifestly participated in creating it. Uh, and so as we lean into the disciplines that call us out of my narrative of acceptance of the church and into God's narrative of what God hopes for all of creation through the, through the work primarily of Jesus Christ who comes uh, and, and uh, as, as I said in reflection with Rob's work, was moved in his gut to do something about the world in which we live and so embodied it himself and gave it to others and sent people out, that same God suffers and dies, who knows the suffering of people uh, who experiences that, not in an absence of activity, but in, as John of the Cross says, uh, a powerful silence, which is at work of remaking the world around it. So it's not just a verbal action or embodied action of the death of the cross, but it is an action, and even in silence, it is making and remaking uh, the world. And so uh, that, that, of course, leads into the resurrection and the transformation uh, uh, of, of all people. Um, and that this, this deep theology that we are engaging recognizes the uh, recreative power of, of the world, not just for the koinonia, right? Part of what we're missing is our koinonia. We, we, we're used to, to the rhythm of going out, our missio and our koinonia are coming back and gathering, and we kind of feel like we're in this, this perpetual missio right now. But what, what we need to recognize is that's bringing us to some sense of attention about the world in which we live uh, and are engaging in, as Rob was saying, that we have the opportunity to use these next 12 weeks to imagine a different church engaged in mission, service, and evangelism in the world uh, in the name of Jesus. And that that, 
that we want to take advantage of that. We, this is not to go back and it won't be normal because we've been through all of this together. And so we have to recognize that, that even now God has moving us towards God's end gathering. The apocalyptic message of the gospel continues to pull us forward. We're not going back to March. We're going to go forward towards the kingdom. That's, that's what's happening when we put ourselves inside of God's narrative instead of what I'm missing about church, instead of what I long. And I do miss church, and I miss the people, and I miss the Eucharist. I miss it all. But those are my parts of the narrative. I've got to figure out what my role in leadership is, my role in the work is, and taking that faith language into the missio uh, into the world that God is already uh, already working in. And so uh, I want to uh, say the next piece of this is that this creative power, this embodiment also uh, has uh, uh, the power to help us see that we are interdependent on one another. That, that part of what happens is that uh, I have been shut in my home for three months and I realize I need people. <laughs> that is a revelation. That is a gospel revelation that we need each other. As people moved out into the streets over the last two weeks, they realized they needed each other. And that some, that some people realized some people needed them to show up and they did. And so it's just to say that we are in the midst always, if we think about what God is doing and recognizing our interdependence. In fact, uh, we really are limited when we live within tribal groups, when we live within uh, monocultural groups, when we limit the kinds of people we engage in, we actually limit our language, we limit our meaning making, we limit the embodiment of, of God's narrative. Because the more we uh, engage with others, the better understanding of the world in which we are moving and having our being is, is aided. If you will, we, we might take the word of Irving Goffman to say our footing, our language footing is better <laughs> when we in, are, are engaging with others uh, because there's a, a widening, he says, a, a reverberation. Uh, that expands what we think of as normal, as etiquette, as certain types, right? So, so we are broken out of a constricted meaning to see God's full meaning of, of a gospel message meant for all people. You, you talked about xenophobia, Rob. We, is, we don't have the luxury of having a gospel limited to Americans. We got a gospel that is, is a world gospel, a cosmic gospel in that sense. It is a reconciliation of this. Now, we may, this may be uncomfortable because we may have spent a large amount of our time waffling and pandering and hiding from this language, seeking peace for the sake of comfort versus unity for the understanding of God's mission. Those are different things. Uh, that great, that great, uh, 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 collect, uh, peace for the sake of comfort and not for God's mission. Those are different things. Again, the silence speaks to us. When we do this, we, we recognize that, that we also uh, have the possibility of the healing power of the gospel, uh, that the language, whether it's embodied, spoken, or in the silence, has a repairing nature to it. Uh, as we engage in God's big narrative. And so I want to think uh, as we come close to here to the end of my time about Tina Fey. Tina Fey is one of my favorite uh, actors, Saturday Night Live, and she's got rules of improv. So the first rule of improv is say yes. Uh, can we say yes to God's narrative and not my narrative? Can we say yes and accept God's gospel proclamation that we are hurtling towards God's great end gathering together. And if we say yes, then can we go to the second rule, which is, are you able to add anything to it? <laughs> what part can you bring? You say yes, and. Say yes, and uh, I'm going to bring something to this work. And the next piece is, are you willing to take risks? Uh, are you willing really to engage? 
or you're just trying to say yes and so they'll go away. And so that final piece is to be able to take risk and the willingness of true engagement with a gospel that has a cross at the crossroads. At the edge of your comfort is a cross uh, and that we are invited to that risk taking place as Jesus uh, was. Uh, and so we are literally building a constitutive, uh, a, 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 a creative, a world repairing uh, work of God's uh, uh, a narrative uh, in the world. And, and, and this, uh, this will, will push us uh, out uh, into uh, the, physical, uh, the physical world around us. Uh, we will, when, if, if we do this well, we will be uncomfortable when we return to the safety of our church. In fact, we might find that our churches is just a bigger room than the one I'm sitting in right now with a few more people in it. And it may lack the kind of audacity of God's uh, work. Now, in order to do this, and uh, of course, uh, I like to do this, I think that we have to continue to be in conversation uh, together uh, and uh, to do this work together to support each other. Uh, and I have always liked that image of Moses when his arms get tired. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes I'm weary on the way. Sometimes I lack the hope. Sometimes I get into my own narrative and I need you all. I need my uh, peers in ministry. I need my cohort uh, to be there with me, to, to lift me up, uh, to remind me uh, of this, this narrative opportunity that's in front of us. Um, and so uh, as we think about this, uh, this the last words I give, I'll give you uh, or that God invites us uh, into convergence of where our narrative meets God's narrative in, uh, in the world of God's creation. Uh, Hans, uh, uh, George uh, Gautamer talked about it as conversation. Are we willing to move out into the world where God is and to have conversation with God in the midst of uh, God's people? Uh, and finally, can we uh, truly uh, engage a meaning-making narrative uh, that breaks out of our tribal uh, canons of language uh, that are so carefully formed and curated in our monocultural, uh, mono-ethnic, uh, even, uh, even our own uh, political partisan uh, tribes.